colleagues to this session where we are interacting as professionals in the risk field, where we are sharing ideas. Uh, welcome, and it's always a pleasure to have you um, around. Uh, I know it would have been good to be close by each other and seeing each other face to face and uh, interacting, but this is the no, new norm, this is the new world we live in. Uh, I'm sorry for the slight delay in starting because we had some technical hitches at the beginning, but I think with all systems go, I will ask uh, Rory to, 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 to share with us the, the risk, uh, Institute of Risk Management overview uh, and the beauty of this world of risk management. Over to you, Rory. Thank you. Uh, uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Rory Poole. I am a membership executive working in the membership team for the IRM. Uh, my role in particular focuses on helping to administer our interest groups and their events, uh, as well as general uh, membership management as well. I'm uh, just going to share my screen as I have some slides. You'll bear with me. Screen, which one is it? There it is. F5. Perfect. Uh, so, yes, I wanted to take a minute or so just to give you a quick overview of the IRM as a whole and then the benefits of membership with us as well. So, the IRM is the leading professional body for enterprise risk management. We help build excellence in risk management to provide to improve the way organizations work. We provide globally recognized qualifications and training, publish research and thought leadership as well. We set professional standards which define the knowledge, skills and behaviors today's risk professionals need to meet the demands of an increasingly complex and challenging business environment. As the professional and educational body for risk management, the IRM plays a leading role in setting these professional standards. They provide a framework for our qualifications and training and for members of continued professional development. Uh, we were founded in April 1986 as an, uh, an awarding organization to meet growing demand for a diploma level qualification in risk management. We're led by AMIC, the Association of Insurance and Risk Managers. Uh, we now deliver general and specialist training courses, events, the Enterprise Risk Magazine, and a variety of other resources to underpin the development of risk professionals across the world. So being part of a professional community can play a critical role in supporting the learning and development you need to progress your career. As a member, you have access to a global community of thousands of risk professionals representing all risks, disciplines, and sectors. We have over 8,000 members from over 100 different countries uh, with whom you can engage either via social media or through your special interest groups and regional groups. These groups are led by our members on a voluntary basis and are a great way to network. We have around 30 regional groups over the world Regional groups are ideal for a broad, broad church of ideas and topics that can be discussed and that sp are specific to your area. In addition to the various regions, we also have a comprehensive range of special interest groups that are dedicated to one particular topic or sector of risk management. Uh, currently, we have 15 different SIGs. Most of our regional and special interest groups events can be attended for free by both members and non-members. However, some of our events are only free for IRM members and for oversubscribed events, priority is given to the members. They can range from guest speakers who are high ranking execs in their sector or experienced academic speakers, panel discussions with a range of experts, roundtable discussions with fellow members of a group to, dis, uh, to brainstorm ideas, or cross events with different uh, regions and SIGs. Uh, the groups provide a great place to gain knowledge and network, uh, and just there you can network with your peers. There is an events calendar, so the website lists all of the upcoming events. So please feel free to browse through the site and then sign up for any other events that pique your interest. And importantly, the attendance at these events also contributes towards your annual CPD. And if you see a group you'd like to learn more about, you can sign up for any number of groups to receive the latest news and event notifications. To do so, simply register on the website by filling out the form on the login section. 
once logged in, uh, visit the groups page that you're interested in, and then click the join this group button at the top right. This will then sign you up to receive their latest news and event notifications. As well as being able to network with other risk professionals, members can also gain access to thought leadership and online resources that give insight and practical guidance on key risk management issues. Uh, we send monthly newsletters to all members and quarterly editions of the Enterprise Risk Magazine, bringing you the latest news and views from across the world of risk management. To further progress your career, members can also work towards gaining professional membership designations that demonstrates to peers and employers your level of knowledge and skills, as well as your commitments to professional development, though this is not available to affiliate members. Members gain discounts on our training, events and conferences, as well as other industry events and publications that we negotiate from time to time on behalf of our members. So that's the overview of our membership benefits. It's a great way to network, learn and gain designations for your name, as well as getting discounts off on our other services. So thank you for your time and I'll hand you back over. Thank you, thank you very much, so much, Rory. Um, I know you were on a roll, um, and I'm sure we will benefit a lot by joining and becoming members and participating and sharing ideas as fellow professionals. So um, we do not just stop there at joining, but uh, but also taking part in the professional exams, and so that we become um, you know, qualified um, in professional in, in the profession. Thank you so so much. I think without further ado, we'll, we'll move on to the reason or the main reason why we are here is there is um, a session, a roundtable discussion on the evaluation of a sector of risk maturity. And Liz Booth is going to facilitate this engagement. Uh, we, we encourage all members, if you've got questions, if you've got comments, uh, to use um, uh, uh, the inbox there that you can put through so that we can, she can then be sharing that with them. Uh, with the participants or the discussions. So Liz is, um, is, a, is a journalist by profession, by trade. She has been worked in that profession for uh, practically her entire life. She's currently the editor of Commercial Risk um, uh, Africa. So she's very passionate about Africa, having grown up in uh, um, Nigeria and also spent some time in South Africa. So she really feels um, part and parcel of this great continent. So over to you, Liz, um, to take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as you just heard, yes, I am indeed very passionate about the continent of Africa. Um, and I think one of the crucial things is managing the risks that exist and looking to the future risks so that the continent can actually develop in the ways that it should. But you don't want to hear from me. You really want to hear from our panelists this afternoon. We've got three great panel discussions coming, or we've got three great panels coming, presentations followed by them by discussions. Um, do use that question box on, on, your, on the screen because we'd love to get lots of questions in from you. We're also going to ask you some very quick poll questions, which I hope you'll say yes, no to. So we do want to make this as interactive as possible. But without further ado, let me introduce our speakers. First of all, we've got Martin, who's the immediate president of the Federation of African Engineering Organizations. He's going to lead us off. Then Terence is going to, who is director and head research at ABMI Research Institute, followed up by Dr. Stanley, executive director of STARS Risk Solutions. So Martin, if I can turn over to you first to, to take us away. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon to all of you. Good morning, good evening, depending on where you're watching from. Uh, may I have the presentation right? Like I, I just have uh, some presentation that I need to walk through. Ah, fantastic. Uh, can you see my screen? Uh, not yet. Uh, so if you go underneath the camera button, uh, then there should be a screen button, and then that allows you to do it. Okay. Martin, it's yeah, the... I'm, I'm it's, trying to share. 
Yeah, it's the it's the button just under the green camera button. Okay. Oh, and uh, it looks like my settings. Oh. Yep, so you're sharing it at the moment, but it's your desktop. Oh, okay. So it's something sharing. Let me just, okay. Uh, fine. Can you see the screen now? We, we see your desktop at the mo moment, Martin. You need to click on the relevant file. Okay, I am on the relevant file, but I don't know why. I, uh, okay. Uh, so on the uh, control panel with the share screen button, you should be able to uh, select the one that is showing. Yeah, apparently it's just showing my... Uh, Okay. Anything? Nothing? Uh, nothing Not at the moment. moment, Martin. Oh, there yep, you go. Okay. I'm giving control. Oh, sorry. Yeah, we can see the presentation now. Ah, fine. So thank you very much. Sorry for the uh, slight delay. Uh, let me just... Uh, can you still see the presentation? Yes, we can. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much, and uh, sorry for the delay. It looks like, yeah, fine. Yes, my outline is, I'm just going to have an overview of the enterprise risk uh, universe and ecosystem. Once I do that, I will then uh, uh, talk about the key drivers, and then uh, propose a, a risk management, and also give you a framework and maturity model uh, suitable for Zimbabwe, and um, then I will make a few recommendations briefly. I would like to invite you, once the biggest risk is over, all of you to Zimbabwe, uh, which is a very beautiful country uh, with a lot of landmarks like the Victoria Falls and many other issues. Again, this presentation, like I said, is to look at uh, uh, enterprise risk management holistically and obviously the goal is to see at which entry level Zimbabwean companies can start taking risk management seriously. Uh, on a maturity level of zero five, I can honestly uh, 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 inform you that most companies are still in the reg region of one or some of them have not even started the systems. So this webinar, uh, uh, to the best of my understanding, is very, very important so that we can start the knowledge-based or, or, or evidence-based risk management systems for Zimbabwe and indeed the rest of Africa. Again, tailoring a, a risk maturity model for the needs of a specific organization or industry for our country or sectors for, for projects uh, will be very, very important for Zimbabwe. Of course, uh, the risk management policy and appetite uh, 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 statements uh, do not exist in many, many organizations in Zimbabwe. And it is very important uh, that we encourage companies to come up with these policies. And these are the policies that will obviously define the principles, the risk categorization, and also the M and, uh, monitoring and, and, and evaluation system of the risk uh, uh, framework. Like I said, risk appetite statements still very rare in our corporates. And obviously, these are important to illustrate how the risk appetite of a company can shape up who you are. 
for instance, you can state high appetite risks uh, related to innovation and technological advancement, or, or, or zero appetite or zero tolerance to risks like corruption, uh, fraud, and issues like that. So it's very, very important for corporations to, to, to look at that. Briefly, just to put the uh, discussion into context, uh, I'm just uh, uh, taking the uh, COSO-1, uh, the enterprise definition, enterprise risk management def definition, which is basically a process uh, 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 affected by an entity's board of directors, management, and other personnel. Uh, and also, it's applied in their strategy, which set across uh, the whole entire uh, enterprise, and it's designed to identify potential events that may if affect the entity, and also to manage the risks, and also within its risk appetite. So it is very, very important that uh, we look at risk uh, 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 enterprise risk management holistically uh, by looking at the internal environment and also objective setting of what we want to achieve, then event identification, and then the risk assessment, response systems, as well as the control activities. Again, this must be properly monitored, communicated across all your divisions and subdivisions. Again, it must go across your operations, your strategic environment, and also your reporting and compliance systems. Uh, looking at this principle, you then want to embed our risk values and systems into your strategic vision, mission, and core values and also embed it throughout your objectives uh, as, as you uh, uh, undertake your risk uh, uh, management uh, process. Once again, it's very, very important to ensure that your risk communication systems uh, are uses relevant information, also leverages on information systems, like the fourth industrial revolution in terms of blockchain, uh, big data analytics and many other things that you can take advantage of. Again, you need to have your risk, risk uh, execution planning done very well by looking at your severity. I will share with you probably a, a small framework, very easy to use for companies that are uh, taking up risk management uh, uh, framework throughout the enterprise. Again, the monitoring of risk uh, and its management performance uh, indices is very, very uh, important. So, in the context of risk management, so you need to embed it, like I said before, throughout your strategic uh, framework. Uh, you look at your company wide operational risks, and then you look at your key mitigants, and then also sector specific risk analysis, as well as plan and forecast the next uh, 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 risks, and have your chart as a dashboard that is moving, and, uh, and you look at it all the time. Again, what is the outcome? What do you expect? Obviously, you expect to reduce the exposure, to manage the risk by either you know transferring it, sharing it, or taking certain risks that you would like to manage to ensure that you achieve your vision, mission, and objectives. Again, organizational resilience is very, very important. You need, again, to make sure that there is alignment of your synergies. Once again, uh, when we're dealing with risk management modeling, you really need to look at your three lines of defense. It, and these three lines of defense, as, as shown above, is basically to look at your management controls, internal control systems, which is the first barrier that you need to deal with. Then the second line of defense is to look at your uh, financial control measures and look at your security systems, risk management, your quality control your whole shake system, and so on and so forth. It is very, very important that we deal with all those issues. The third one is obviously an internal audit. And obviously, you have to leverage it with your uh, external audit and also your risk, uh, 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 your, your external auditing and also your compliance uh, uh, management framework to regulations and the laws of the country. I just took a bit of time to look at the core uh, issues that internal audit should look at, which means you know assurances that the control systems are effective, 
and also giving assurance on the risk management process and also evaluating the risk management process as well as reporting of material risks and opinions on risk management as well as uh, reviewing the management of material risks. But there are also uh, uh, certain things that audit should not do for management. And these are areas where, you know, you need to make sure that there is a, a, a legitimate internal audit roles with, with safeguards that you look at, uh, uh, you know, is the control systems conforming uh, to your setting? And also, are you really looking at uh, uh, giving advice uh, on identifying and, uh, and evaluating your, your risks? Certain things uh, that risk uh, should not do, risk management should not do for um, our management is basically not to, uh, to, 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 to uh, set the controls themselves and certain measures. Again, these roles and the responsibility of risk should be based on your policy that you have. So we are looking at your, uh, in an organization, you should have the risk owner, and the risk owner is obviously accountable uh, for management uh, of the risk, uh, you know, having the highest interest in that risk being correctly treated and managed. Again, you should also have a risk management focal point that coordinates the whole risk management processes. Uh, it's very, very important also to make sure that there's a responsible person or business unit for implementing or in mitigation measures uh, for the identified risks. And then senior management sponsorship is very, very important as we go. What, what are the models that we have in projects? For instance, we are working on the Wang expansion project and we, we do have a very comprehensive project management risk maturity model that we use for a project of that nature. And we are guided by the PIMBOK, which is the uh, PMI a, a, a guide to, to project management. And this again has to make sure that you, in a project, you also need to have a, 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 a clear risk management model that you use that look at your culture, processes, and experiences, uh, as well as looking at the perspective of how you manage it throughout the project life cycle, cost management, as well as uh, uh, market and finance, uh, financial interventions. Again, I propose a very simple measure that we use where uh, on that maturity model of one to five, you, you just make sure that on each of those four uh, uh, centers that we look at, you multiply where your company is at, whether it's at one, at four, or at five, uh, and therefore giving you a total of 625 it is, if it's totally compliant, and then one if it's on the minimum level. So it's very, very important that we also look at issues, uh, uh, small issues uh, like, like this. It's very, very important uh, that uh, the initial level is also like looking at how your risk appetite is. Is it fragmented, limited, just to, to a framework? And also then maybe you develop to the second level where you then are looking at uh, the systems are developed, but also it's exactly how are you looking at your risk framework. Then level three looks at how your framework and risk appetite is in place and how you practice it. It's also the advanced level is also looking at the integrated in strategic, in your in strategic planning, in your operations, as well as today today uh, operations, all the way to the advanced systems of your, your, your risk framework. I think I, uh, the, 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 the presentation will be circulated and I, I'm sure you are very, very familiar with most of these uh, 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 frameworks that we use. Again, you have to go at governance levels, at process and integration, at systems and tools and risk capabilities and also your risk culture. And we are advocating that companies in Zimbabwe establish themselves in such a generic model uh, and then move uh, advanced. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, of the next speakers, we speak of specific models, one to insurance and the other to organizational level and strategy. So it's very, very important that you also need to measure and access on how you are developing 
for example, if you are still on the initial stage, you go to the development, you go to the established, the advanced, and, and so on and so forth. It's very, very important for you to measure and look at each, how all those uh, uh, frameworks are set up in a system. Again, the recommended actions are setting up the, you know, or, or looking at your operations, uh, all your uh, involvement of all your organizations, and then registering the risks in, in risk, risk registers and workshops, then structuring the risk and governance, as well as moving on to the process and integration of the systems. It is very, very important uh, that you look also at your risk capabilities and the risk culture. Again, it's just an example of how you can list your top risks uh, according to the World Economic uh, uh, Forum. And I'm sure this will be exciting as we have the environmental, social and governance risks. They have been overlooked. And when the pandemic struck, most companies were unprepared. And it is very, very uh, surprising that I will recommend that organizations going forward should look at the ESG risks very seriously. The social risks are now very, very important, not only because of the pandemic, but also because of climate change. And also look at social conflict, look at Afghanistan uh, and issues like that. So these are issues that we, we are very, very uh, uh, serious about in our risk, in our risk appetite. Uh, once more, uh, uh, the global examples of what happens are so many, I don't even want to tackle many of them, but look at Wells Fargo, what happened to, to, to Uber. There were suspicions that most of the hired drivers were not uh, were harassing uh, some of their passengers uh, sexually. And as a result, the reputational risk damage to Uber was very huge. There are so many examples that we have a uh, risk of corruption, uh, the publicity that goes with it, et cetera, et cetera. I have so many examples which I think uh, most of you in the business are aware of. Once again, risk is impacted by your governance and culture, by your strategies and your objectives, and also in your execution and where, how well you communicate your, your, your risks. Uh, according to the uh, COSO uh, uh, ERM framework, you again have to look throughout your value systems, throughout your organizational management systems, uh, and so on and so forth. But what I want to emphasize is that management uh, of risk appetite is important. You also need to ensure that your inherent risk or residual risk, I mean, uh, your, your residual risk is taken care of. Uh, you, you certainly really need to make sure that if your actual risk is greater than your appetite, then you then face a lot of other actions that you need to take to address the deficiencies uh, and also to look at how you can deal with the root causes and the barriers and so on and so forth. So this is just a, a, an example of a simple framework of a risk analysis where you do your identification, which is about your, your risk assessment. We measure it, you prioritize, and then after that you manage it, which is by controlling, sharing, transferring, or making sure that you have a diverse, you diversify your, your, your management systems or, 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 or interactions to ensure that you are not uh, seriously. Again, risk monitoring and evaluation is important at all the levels and also it is very very important that your criteria is properly set the simple uh, risk uh, uh, criteria that i i i'm looking at is looking at the uh, uh, likelihood the consequences of those likelihoods uh, not have been taken care of or managed again that can be then ranked into the severity i'm just looked at three levels but most Organizations can look at five levels uh, going to people where it is extremely high, et cetera, et cetera. So once you have a scientific way of looking at your risk, where you evaluate the events which increase the likelihood of, your, or con of, of the consequences, you then can now look at the impacts and then you look at the likelihood scores and then you can easily look at your risk classification and compliance matrix in a very, very simple way. Again, the framework has to have an adequacy and effectiveness methodology, which looks at what are the trigger events, which then looks at the barriers uh, at the organization, at the program, and at the individual level, and address those. The implication is what can go wrong if we do not address the risks that we have identified, and so on and so forth. 
I will just say a, a, a jump to uh, the recommendation and, expl a, 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 and action plans that I'm recommending for Africa, for Zimbabwe. One is uh, looking at risk management, development, and compliance at the country level. And in Zimbabwe, we have the Corporate Government Act and many other companies act that really now we have taken a risk management and risk appetite to the dashboard of management. Again, need of cross-functional and also objectives and, and goals and missions of the organizations taken care of, and also developing a reference maturity model for Zimbabwe is very important. And then once we develop an enterprise risk management framework and policy, it's important for the uh, organization to then look at its application, implementation, and, uh, and monitoring and evaluation. Again, process integration of the processes must be put in place and the Martin, development of we, tools. Sorry, Martin, yes. we're, we're getting quite tight on time. Are you, are you almost um, finished now? Can we? Yes, I'm moment? done. I'm just giving my conclusion. I'm okay. just giving my conclusion. And which then, in conclusion, the lack of uh, risk appetite, uh, the lack of risk uh, culture and appetite in our companies is proved costly. So we need to update risks to cover all the ESG areas as well as the SDGs uh, and ensure that we uh, take risk management seriously and put it in the dashboard of management. Uh, I think this was my presentation and I conclude by the uh, famous uh, quote by Einstein where no problem can be solved at the same level at which it was created. Thank you very much for this opportunity and time to present to yourselves. Thank, thank you very much indeed, Martin. Now, I know that was a huge gallop through an awful lot of information, um, but um, so, sadly time is tight today. So I'm gonna hand over very quickly to Terence to give us his presentation, Terence. All right, uh, afternoon, everyone. Um, as I wait to be able to do the presentation, um, I'd like to maybe start by introducing myself. Uh, my name is Terence Murastiki. I am a director uh, and head of research for the ABMI Research Institute. We are a risk management consulting company, but what's unique about our organization is obviously that in addition to normal consultancy, we have developed and authored a unique methodology in risk management that is called the attribute-based maturity index. So that is our life, that is what we, we invest in, that is what we focus in throughout the work that we do. Uh, can I just ask that I get the right to project? Thank you. Okay, waiting. Or can someone project for me that has the right? Oh, there we go. Thank you. I'm good. Thank you. Perfect. Okay, so thank you very much uh, for, for your patience. Um, so essentially what I would like to do today is sort of take you through key highlights from a sector perspective when it comes to risk maturity. What are some of the things that we're learning when it comes to risk maturity on the ground? Um, so like I said before, what I started with about eight, 10 years ago was the idea that risk maturity assessments cannot just be random pro uh, procedures or processes. Uh, I had come across a discussion where people agreed that they would uh, uh, come up with a, a methodology and agree on a methodology to do a risk maturity assessment. And it worried me a lot because I said, well, if you're going to come up with it on the spot, the danger is that it is not really bankable. It, it is a methodology that I've come up with in order to rate myself, which basically is going to be biased towards only the areas that I know about. And it might not consider the overall scope of the work that one must actually focus on. So behind the attribute-based maturity index was a maturity model. But in addition to that, it became a full-on implementation model for risk management. So in other words, there are organizations out there that merely follow the principles in the attribute-based maturity index. But as they do that, they are not ignoring ISO or COSO. What it is is they just work with a practical model 
for implementing ISO, for implementing COSO, for implementing King 4. As, as you are aware, uh, different areas have different demands or different uh, requirements from a legislative policy and norms perspective. So ABMI is obviously primed to be more relevant from that perspective. So the knowledge itself is captured in a book. It's formalized. So I've always said, if you take an assessment using this model and somebody says, what is this method? You throw the 300 page book at them and ask them to read it in their spare time. So, but essentially what this is, is it's a full on guideline of what is risk management? How do the elements work? And we don't leave anything to, to interpretation. So for example, you hear the word risk appetite a lot. In the attribute based maturity index or in this ABMI reference library, that is clarified in detail. So you're able to actually understand what really is it? Because the general uh, nuance of what appetite means is what people are going to go for. They're going to say, well, I suppose appetite means how much, how hungry am I? And I think therefore risk appetite means this. So from a practical perspective, what we've done is tried to uh, 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 clarify even what seems basic or what seems simple. The idea is we want a model that is progressive and that considers a wide range of opinions uh, out there. The next one is the risk management model itself. Now, the risk model itself, the ABMI risk model, works on components. It's like a tree structure. So we start with seven components, codified A to G. We go to 24 attributes. Then we go to 106 sub-attributes. Then we go to 174, what we call demonstrations of actual capability. So no more guessing, no more guesswork, because what would happen is if you were guessing, you would say, we manage risks appropriately. And somebody says, mm, if I have a scale, where do you think I'm gonna put it? If I were asked, I manage risks, well, I'm gonna put it right at the end, you know, because that's, it's called bloating your own ego. Uh, but what this model does is it's practical. It talks to the real issues around your risk management. It's a pity we're not doing a demo today, one of these days, maybe we can schedule a session where we do a real live uh, simulation for a specific organization and one sort of gets to see the true picture unfolding. So essentially, this is the structure of it. If you look at A, that is culture. Culture is king. Um, but you then see B, C, and D uh, talking about integration. A lot of this is about integrating. If we don't integrate, we are failing. And then there is the traditional aspects of risk management, which is identifying and assessing risks and responding. But then we also then go into a progressive monetary process for risk management. Now, let me talk to, to then, how is it that the ABMI maturity assessment looks? What is it that we looked at? Then I'll unpack the results of the study. Basically, the maturity assessment considers 106 sub-attribute statements. It is by no means, like I said, a 10 question uh, assessment. It is by no means easy to complete in like five minutes. However, the value we get having gone through the specific details is very useful. So they go through 106 sub-attribute statements. Uh, so in total, there are about 130 assessment lines. Uh, they use an online tool, which is basically available on the internet. You go to abmi.co.za and people sign up and they take the assessment. Now, the results I'll give you today are based on those people that have uh, participated in this study. Uh, the responses they give to questions are not yes, no questions. I suppose it's no on the, on the extreme, documented only, representing the majority of cases. I'm talking here about situations where people have a policy but never implement a policy, or people have a framework but have never actually practiced it. That is very common. So we have actually reserved a level for something like that. And it actually will never get you past level two out of six maturity, by the way, to document things. Doing things starts taking you further up the maturity ladder, partially implemented, mostly in place, and then yes, always practiced. Different attributes and sub-attributes carry different weights. So not everything is, is, means the same or, or gives you the same marks depending on what you say, as well as different responses also carry specific weights. So we basically are telling up a collection of responses over 130 different lines to give you an outcome. So the maturity score that comes up as a result of that is given to you as a percentage. Uh, it can be either at level one, non-functional, two, defining, three, developing, four, implementing, five, managing, or six, optimizing. So those are the levels. Typical CMMI kind of levels, zero to five. We prefer to go one to six because most people hate being told they're level zero. Uh, the maturity score that you get as a result of this is then compared 
I'm no longer seeing my slides, apologize. The maturity score is then added up and that is compared to what's called the sector benchmark. Comparing it to a sector benchmark allows you to see how you're doing versus your peers. This benchmarking capability is also been rolled out at country level, at provincial level, and at, you know, so basically we can create a group of entities and establish a new benchmark based on a unique collective. So remember, as I present this, if you see your organization or your sector looking good, it does not mean your organization is actually good. You would need to actually have your own view based on your own organization's performance. So please don't resist the urge to see that maybe insurance is doing well and assume that, oh, because we're an insurance company, we ought to be good. That's not necessarily the way it is. Uh, then improvement plans are obviously generated automatically as well as uh, the relevant reporting that is generated as a result of that. Now, in terms of the highlights themselves, we monitor 42 sectors. They continue to be adjusted on a, on a biannual basis. We have about 240 unique individual, about 80 something corporate and another uh, a collective of other users, which takes the user base on the technology platform to date to over just slightly over 300. Now, this is very good. And I think the map on the left sort of shows you the representation throughout Africa. We have other areas, of course, globally that are also starting to latch on to some of the principles behind this and uh, accept that convenience is convenient, especially if it's substantive and meaningful. Um, but the most active sectors, which ones are those? Are the public entities. This is a categorization of public entities that are necessarily, not necessarily state, uh, uh, national government, not provincial, not state-owned companies, but entities as established that are established in terms of uh, as, as, as subsidiaries or as enti implementing uh, entities of, of government. Other financial services, aviation and transport services was also very active. State-owned companies very active in, in this whole distribution. Insurance has done very well. I'm happy to see Lee's booth here also to see that your sector is also quite excited here. Uh, production general has also been quite a very active sector. We also monitor what we call our average risk maturity or benchmark. That has been slowly but steadily fluctuating around a similar number. Um, you will notice that between 2020 and 2021 too, the dash one just means the first half of, of the year, the dash two means the second half of the year. You will notice that we have actually slightly deteriorated across the spectrum. And why we are deteriorating is simple. The moment we are implementing a framework from 1998 or 2000 or 2006, we are outdated. So what happens is as emerging practices come up, we start sliding back down because we are no longer doing what we ought to be doing in our current circumstances. So the only way we grow is we've got to become agile. We've got to become adaptable when it comes to our risk maturity. Key highlights, highest unverified maturity score ever achieved was 87.43, which is level five. Highest verified score was 62.84, which is level four. Verified means somebody uh, within the institute has actually independently verified it. The lowest unverified score is 17.59. We have had some that have just simply walked away and said, I'm not going to do well at all. Um, in, in a nutshell, no one has ever achieved a level six maturity. Um, and, and we always say, if you should, let the assessment be verified so we can at least give you credit duly. In terms of the average distribution of sectors when it comes to maturity, you will see on this graph that there's a typical normal distribution uh, showing that on the, on the lower end, you've got the nonprofits, education sector, intermediaries, uh, the mass media, uh, as well as local government. So these are not doing very well in terms of managing risk. You've got those that are sort of on the extreme, doing very well, healthcare funding, pharmaceuticals, passenger services, insurance, telecoms, aviation services and banking. Then you've got those that are sort of crowding around the actual average, some on the lower end and some sitting on the higher end. This you will be able to see. I won't list everything for you. Um, let's look at the top three. Who are some of the top three sectors that one uh, is coming across when we look at this? We are seeing that banking uh, uh, tops the list just ever slightly uh, at 69.76. Uh, we've got aviation services also doing pretty well in terms of uh, uh, the maturity, and this is uh, based on a quite a wide distribution of respondents, so that's good. And then telecoms also fighting in that uh, space uh, from an average maturity perspective. So I think these are generally the, 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 the levels of maturity we're seeing. The orange background demonstrates the average. 
So most all three of them, of course, are above the general average. We then go to the lower three, the lower three performers looking at local government, education, and nonprofits. Generally struggling, of course, is local government and municipalities. There's need to sort of rejig or rework that whole sector. Education also finding difficulties around um, whether it's higher education or, or, or basic education entities. The, just the general focus on risk management is not very strong across the across the board. Nonprofits uh, struggling quite a lot, and this is not a good picture, of course, that they are painting because I would imagine that a, any any grant funded entity would like to maybe a bit be a bit stronger when it comes to managing risk. Uh, uh, going forward. But I think the difficulty you find in some of the organizations is they'll say, well, I never had the funds for it. And it's simple. Risk management, unfortunately, costs money. It has to be done. It costs resources. Uh, and I think those then become the difficulties they experience. Highest activity sectors, how have they done? So I'm looking here at about seven sectors. Aviation services. Uh, parents, we, I, hate to, yep? I hate to interrupt uh, you, but we are really tight on yeah. time. Do you think I we know, can... <laughs> No worry, there's two minutes, I'll be good. Apologize. Um, so showing again a pattern that shows that maturity is going up as w and then tapering down because of difficulties around people not being necessarily as dynamic. Other public entities is worrying. There has been a steady decline in their maturity as a sector. Insurance also registering a slight decline. The average risk maturity by practice area, now this is a very important one. Risk culture and leadership, we are there above average. Risk response and optimization is one of those gremlins we are still struggling with within the institute. It always shows a spike. I suppose if you identify the wrong risks and but you mitigate them very well, you might say I'm very good at risk response. However, I'm not good at risk identification and assessment, which is the pattern that you are seeing here. Monitoring and communication also showing that it's basically operating and hovering around average levels. You can see a very clear picture here. Integration is the problem. Uh, because we are still probably operating as silos. Risk is still a compliance function that sits in a corner and that is done by a specific unit. We need to build integration. On risk culture and leadership, we need to talk about risk policies, culture, risk appetite, risk tolerance, ethics, leadership, and consequence management, as well as monitoring compliance to the principles of our risk policy. When it comes to strategy integration, let's communicate and entrench our strategies. Let's build risk return analysis into our planning. Consider risk appetite in your planning and always have a plan B when you do your planning because things are not as predictable as we think. It is not a perfect world. Things change. You cannot be saying, well, I never thought it would change. Therefore, that is why my plan has gone to the dogs. You've got to always have a backup plan. Performance integration is another area with key areas of importance that say you need to integrate performance with your risk management. You are not doing well if you drive at 180 kilometers per hour to, from Harare to Bulawayo. Uh, by ticking the box that says I got there on time when you drove at such a reckless speed. Integrate risk and performance. Sustainability, another big gap. Um, I think the previous speaker spoke about this whole ESG issues. We talk about BESG where B talks critically to the business model. So some organizations that are struggling are struggling purely because their business model is flawed. Risk identification and assessment across the board is an area of improvement. Risk response and optimization, another area needing work, particularly when it comes to actually understanding that we have gone past the age where we must have a control for everything. We have gone past the age where there must be a person at the door ticking your receipt against a, in a book. I think some of you have come across that. You've just paid, somebody asked for your receipt, put it in a book, and then after that, somebody stops you and stamps your receipt. Those are, that's a control-based culture. We need to move beyond that. I used to be an auditor. I feel responsible, I feel like I'm part of the problem. But I think we need to become smarter when it comes to how we respond to risk and optimize. Understand risk can also have its opportunity. Don't just have a view of risk as something to be reduced or something to be avoided. It is also something you can take proactively to build value. On monitoring and communication, incident management, combined assurance, very key areas of improvement in that area. Uh, and my parting shot is to say, Close your gaps. It's not about the maturity score, it's about the gaps, closing the gaps. Assess maturity annually. Use a consistent model. Don't run away from something that punishes you just because you think you can find an easier one where you can slide the scale. Do what needs to be done. And let us focus on adopting what we call a unitary risk maturity model. Every time we create another one and another one and another one, we're simply just avoiding facing the fact that if this is correct and this is what I ought to do, 
running away to this one is really just a means of saying, uh -uh, this one punished me, let me go to my friends there. They're gonna tell me everything is good. I'm sorry I don't have enough time, but all this is technology driven, of course. Um, but with uh, that, I'd like to say thank you. Uh, there's a lot to learn. There's a lot within the slides and that I had to take out. But uh, thank you. That is the picture I just wanted to put to you. Have a good day. Thank you very much indeed, Terence. I think we could have actually spent an hour on each of these presentations. And Dr. Stanley, I'm going to urge you to be as um, as quick as you can be, just because I would love to be able to get some questions from the audience. And at the rate we're going, we're not going to get any questions from the audience in. So please, if you wouldn't mind, um, if you could whip through, I know everybody will be seeing your slides afterwards. So okay. um, over to you, Stanley. Thank you. Okay. Can I be allowed to share my screen? You you should be now. Can you see my screen? Yes. You can, yes. Okay. So I'm just going to go straight into my discussion. Uh, what I want to look at is to have a look at uh, how companies actually benefit from uh, embedded enterprise risk management. Uh, we did a paper um, some time back, and uh, this was actually uh, published in, uh, we, we presented the uh, Society of uh, Actuaries some time back. So I just wanted to just uh, present some of uh, the findings uh, that we have there. So the main objective of the study was uh, whether to, to check whether here I'm actually, does it actually uh, add value? especially the matured enterprise risk management. And uh, the underpinnings uh, with regard to this particular study, just looking at um, uh, the classical theories, the modern uh, finance, finance theories actually underlying how we measure uh, value. So usually whenever I look at what are the sources of value, and then we can actually say if we implement risk management, what are the benefits that it actually present? So at times you can actually reduce under investment as a substitution, we can also look at uh, the risk aversion, then also to look at urgent problems that can also be eliminated. So in terms of the insurance company, we say fine, let's divide it into sort of the three parts. So the underwriting function, the investment function, also the capital management. These are sort of value. Uh, you can actually look at value addition in those particular areas. So we can actually sort those as the sources of value. So if we implement risk management, we can actually stabilize the underwriting function, also stabilize the investment uh, risk that we have, then ultimately we can actually create value within an insurance company. So one of the main uh, aspects of the principle of risk management is actually we need to add value by actually uh, implementing enterprise risk management. So we can also expect that more value can actually be added in as as long as we we mature uh, the models. It can actually be seen. We can even actually look at or at optimization level and so say, fine, uh, this is the level that we can actually reach and we can actually reach the crest or a peak where we can actually look at equilibrium points. In terms of um, the, uh, I think I, I've sort of highlighted the risk profile of the insurance coming, you're underwriting your investment, and uh, you can actually use capital management to actually do that. Then if I look at the methodology that we actually used was to look at um, the key, um, uh, uh, performance indicators, what you call the key value drivers in an insurance company, your return on capital and surplus combined ratio, then operating. So we are tracking these to see fine if we are implementing enterprise risk management. So these particular drivers should actually be stabilized because the main essence of risk management is actually to reduce uh, the spread of um, that distribution. If it's a loss distribution, we, we, we reduce the spread. If it's a return distribution, we'll also be able to uh, confine it, but we can actually shift it to the way we want it to do if it's want to increase returns but in a more constrained manner. So we want to look at whether this money can actually constrain or actually manage to constrain uh, volatility within an insurance company. So this is the measure that we actually use sort of some average uh, points. So in terms of uh, the robustness of this particular model, just look at sort of uh, some historical uh, values that we have and also to look at income that we actually generate and we can actually say, fine, uh, this is how much capital is employed and we can actually divide and see uh, the value that was created. Uh, in terms of the hypothesis, uh, what I wanted to, what I wanted to look at is to say, fine, uh, here I'm practicing insurance companies maintain low volatility in terms of cash flows. That's sort of the result of risk management. You should actually reduce volatility in terms of your your, your values. 
some of the other assumptions, uh, the main assumption that you find is that we can actually look at uh, one, it reduces volatility, risk money reduces volatility uh, of interest earnings, your, your losses, and we can also look at uh, the performance actually improves. It also increases resilience within the main drivers that they become more resilient, they become sort of more stable uh, the way we want. And also we can actually see that whenever we increase uh, the level of risk management, it uh, goes to an equilibrium point. We can actually reach an equilibrium point. We can, we can, when we look at the marginal benefits would actually cause the marginal cost of actually implementing ERA. So even though we want to mature ERA and we are maturing it and we are actually increasing, there is a point where we say we can actually continue to pay, spend resources uh, that we have. So this is sort of what we were sort of measuring. So the data and analysis, we use AM-based data. So we actually used sort of a, a period which was quite interesting, which is actually the year 2000 to 2009. Uh, because it's financial crisis. So this uh, was actually sort of a, you find that there was uh, uh, Arik and Rita, Wilma, we also were 9-11, we also have the financial crisis 2008. So we wanted to look at those companies that implemented ERM, did they actually experience stability in terms of their earnings or their key drivers that we have actually mentioned. So we actually divided into periods. So say fine period number one, two, three, four, five periods. So we wanted to look at volatility within a particular window, then we can actually compare it by period uh, that we have. So these are the results that we actually lose. So the first driver was actually capped with surplus volatility. And what we actually saw is that actually, whenever it comes to the change, you would actually see that between uh, period number one, two, three, you would find that uh, volatility, the amount of reduction in terms of volatility for those companies that actually implemented ERM, actually you find that the level of uh, volatility that was reduced actually increased between the period. And this might actually attribute to the increased maturity that you'd actually have. And it, uh, the level of uh, uh, reduction of volatility actually reaches sort of an equilibrium where you find that even though we might have a negative 18% as the mean or negative 25% within the second period, but you find that it didn't actually double or it didn't actually reduce by that much uh, when you look at the period three about negative 28%. So the other thing that you also find was that those companies that didn't actually implement ERM during that particular window, they actually experienced increased volatility in their earnings. And you'd find that in terms of the volatility, it was quite uh, marked. So if you look at the second period, about 32%, but when you look at uh, the other periods now, you would find that uh, we, we, we had a period where there the was an increase in terms of 45% in terms of volatility. So which means that in terms of implementing ERM, there are some advantages and you could actually see from the results that you're actually seeing that uh, when the, the programs are maturing. Why are we uh, saying this? Because after 9-11, a number of insurance companies, uh, especially in the United States, even across the, the Europe, they started implementing enterprise, they started to take it seriously. And we could actually pick those from their financial statements, what they are actually reporting. Then we can actually classify them as those that we're implementing, those that we are not actually implementing. And we could actually see the results of actually implementing enterprise risk management. So this is one key driver. The second key driver as well, say, fine, let's look at the second key driver. You could also see that there was a reduction in the, in the combined ratio of volatility, that the combined ratio actually started to, the volatility started to, to decrease negative 20%. Uh, you can see negative 27 then negative 27 uh, between the third period as well. But if you look at uh, the period going into 2008, 2009, to the, uh, 2008, you'd find that uh, there was a lot of volatility that actually went or increased during that particular period. Why? Because it would, we had uh, Eric and Rin, Rita, Wilma, and uh, Katrina, and also but the, the financial crisis actually coming in the credit for swaps impacting the portfolio. So, the companies that were implementing ERM actually exhibited a reduction in volatility, which means that whenever you are maturing your ERM, the, the results should also show. Those companies that we are not implementing, they actually show that the volatility was also increasing. Then on the operating ratio, the same applies that the operating ratio would actually see that there was a negative 24%, negative 26, negative 25% reduction, but there was also an increase in terms of the mean uh, in terms of uh, volatility in for the uh, commas that we are not implementing the RIM. Uh, then sort of the trend you could actually see, we were also looking at the number of companies that we are actually reducing volatility. So the moment these, you say commas are actually started adopting, uh, initially we found about 295, then we also had about uh, 391, 455. These were the commas that we are actually reducing the level of volatility in their companies. So it also attests to the uh, number of commas that we are actually adopting ERM actually getting the benefits of implementing enterprise risk management. 
we could actually say the same thing whenever it comes. Just, I'm just summarizing the results that have already uh, uh, highlighted. But the comment that I want to make, ERM is, has been effective since its implementation, just looking at insurance companies at the beginning of the study. Then we can actually see that cash flow volatility has been reduced even at a faster rate. The same applies to uh, the, the, the number of companies that we are actually reducing uh, volatility. We have seen increasing number of companies reducing volatility by actually implementing ERM. So you should also be able to see these results within Zimbabwe, within Zambia, within the, the countries, the moment companies actually start to adopt risk management. And this should actually come through as well. So this, same, uh, this is sort of the same uh, uh, discussion. So whenever I go through the slides, it's just comparing uh, the reduction to the different uh, value measures. And uh, we also did a post-crisis analysis uh, to see what, what would actually happen after the post-crisis analysis. You also find that because of the, even though they are, they are the, because of the crisis, we wanted to see whether there was a, a marked increase in quality. There wasn't much for the insurance companies. Why could they actually adopted ERM much better? So in terms of the mean, in terms of the increase based given the, the crisis, it wasn't much, but you would actually expect a, a huge uh, a jump in terms of volatility, but it wasn't actually evident within the particular companies because of the implement of ERM. Then now uh, the concluding remarks, you can, we could actually see that ERM actually, whenever you mature it, it's when it matures, it can actually deliver consistent reduction in volatility, even sustained um, resilience that you have within the company. So some of the other things that you also see, we should actually see your ERM actually delivering certain value whenever you mature it. And uh, whenever implementing these projects, we also want to see it being measured. Say, if I'm implementing project, what was the um, volatility then, but what is the volatility now? What are the changes that we have? So this should be measured to actually see whether the programs actually delivered any value to the organization or not. Uh, these are some of the things that we, we were looking sort of how our, our um, risk was actually being increased during a, a certain period. So you can actually see this period running to 2006, there was a lot of uh, risk taking that actually happened, but we didn't actually see that with insurance companies. So in terms of my con my uh, conclusion, embedded ERM does add value. That's uh, uh, the conclusion that I uh, can make. So that's uh, my presentation in short. Thank you so much, Dr. Stanley. I know that was a whip through. I could hear you were talking fast. Thank you so much. <laughs> We've got some questions coming from the, the floor and I'm hoping we can get time for them. I'm just actually going to ask our audience if they wouldn't mind asking, answering just a very few quick poll questions. So I have, um, the basically we've asked this question of the audience, have the following risks worsened this year? The first one is political risk. Do you think that the um, that those risks have increased this year? I don't know if you can see that. I'm really hoping that you'll either select one or two. Can you see it, everybody? That's the key question. Yeah, I can see the answers coming in. So we're collecting responses here and we've got 71% saying yes and 29% saying no. So I'm going to move us on to the next question, which has, have financial risks increased this year or not? So again, if you could select one, 100% are saying 94%. So a few of you are thinking, no, that financial risks haven't increased this year. Um, I can see a lot of you are voting. So thank you very much for that. Um, 96% are saying yes and 97% and just three of you think that it hasn't increased. I'm going to close that one down and I'm going to ask you the next question which is financial resources. Do you think these risks have increased in the past year, yes or no? And I'll just give you a few minutes to answer this is not quite so clear cut as the financial one and 83 percent of you are saying the the that the hr risks have increased and 70 percent 17 percent say no I'm going to close that one. Thank you for doing these. It's really appreciated. 
cyber. Do you think cyber risk has increased? Yes or no? And um, actually, this is really interesting. So we got to 65% of you having voted, and it was still 100% saying that there was a problem with cyber. And now we've, we've changed that ever so slightly, but still 97% of you think cyber risks have increased, and by far the majority of you have voted. So thank you very much for doing that. Um, we've got just a couple more questions. The last one, exchange rate. Do you think those risks have increased in the past year or not? Yes or no? And we are asking all these questions for a very good reason, not least because we're going to be talking to our panellists about them, the results in just a moment. And we'll also obviously be bringing the, the questions in from the audience. And on this one, you say 82% of you think it has and 18% say it hasn't. So thank you very much indeed for that. Two more questions very quickly. Has COVID in any way changed your organization's approach to risk management in the past year? So has the pandemic made your company appreciate the value of risk management do you think that your company now considers you more important or less than they did before and again you've got lots of you voting and it's interesting how many of you hitting the yes buttons on all of these um, but you are now saying is 81% of you think that it has provided a boost for risk management. Oh, maybe not a couple more of you have changed, voted, and we are fairly fixed on 79% saying yes, and 21% saying no, it hasn't changed the organization's view. Thank you very much for voting on that. And my very, very final questions, has COVID proved a boost for risk managers themselves? Do you think that risk managers have become more important to their organizations? So not only do they want better risk management, but do they actually see that risk managers are the people to provide it? And you are busy voting away. And we've got there, we've got 79% saying yes and 23% saying no. So I will close that vote down and say thank you very much indeed um, for all of you to, for taking part in that. Um, it is really interesting to see how you voted. Overwhelmingly, I think you would agree that risks have changed in the past year. And our question then for the panelists, of course, is do you think as those risks have, have changed that um, risk managers have increased their maturity? Um, so what I'd like to do is if I could throw it open to you and just really ask the first question of how risk management and risk managers have fared in the pandemic in your view. Um, I don't know who would like to start that one off. Gody, I don't know whether, or Maggie, whether you would like to come, maybe Maggie, you'd like to come in on that one first. But do you think that um, risk manager and risk management do you agree with the poll findings do you think that they have been increasing in importance in the past year yeah maybe, maybe let me come in uh, i think they are spot on what is uh, shown the world is that uh, if you don't manage your risks very well you will not survive in the new normal and the next normal so most companies, especially after the pandemic, is they've taken risk management so seriously, uh, especially the BESG ones, that without them, there is no going concern. So I agree with the poll. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Maggie, would you like to come in? I, I know you were trying to unmute yourself there. Thank you, Liz. I also agree with the poll that uh, even if we look, he, he, especially here in Zimbabwe, if you look at the public sector, the public sector has been lagging behind uh, in the implementation of ERM, but with the pandemic, it has really shown us 
that it's a gap that we really need to fill. And most of the organizations now are seriously uh, implementing ERM. Thank you. Thank you. Terence, do you want to come in or, or Stanley? Yeah, I can come in. I just, just on meeting. Okay, go first. Go first. Okay, yes, on the two, but I think there, there is one area which we, which we have observed within the insurance sector that uh, a number of companies within the insurance sector in uh, emerging markets, they were not actually managing the technology risk very well. And uh, because of that, they were actually caught uh, um, unawares. So they did not actually prepared for the change. So in some of the other lines of business, you would find that the uh, business actually dried up when the lockdowns actually happened until they started actually implementing tech, sort of a changing now and actually selling their products online. So this has actually uh, become very important, like even the technology has become very important for, for the insurance sector, uh, as we have actually observed. Okay. Terence? Um, yes, thank you. I just wanted to, to look at it maybe from a different perspective and say that each profession struggles with a challenge at a point in time, auditors at some point were thought to be bloodhounds and they had to fight for that. I think risk managers, their biggest challenge was do managers in the business understand that they have a role in managing risk? Now, there is a risk manager becoming more recognized. Then there's a question of do managers appreciate now more than ever that they ought to manage risk if they are to prevail and be successful? And I want to say that definitely the answer has been in the affirmative. However, we've had situations, of course, where uh, the first thing I saw were risk practitioners were told, you are now dealing with COVID cases. You are now doing uh, recording incidents of COVID. You are now doing that. And I said, the moment one thinks a risk manager must go and tabulate the number of COVID, COVID cases in a company, it's yet more evidence that one is not understanding the strategic relevance of this role. So we have both sides, unfortunately. We have those that have turned risk into administrators. Yes, they feel busier, we feel busier, but we are not actually doing the strategic work we ought to be doing, which is forward looking. We are lucky if we're in an organization, like Martin said, where the executives realize the significance and therefore re-elevate us to that level. But even if we are elevated as practitioners, we need to upskill ourselves because clearly the risks that we're dealing with are so diverse that one form of training alone is not going to do it. Uh, that's my point, yeah. Mm. Goody, I don't know if you uh, are still there, um, whether you've kind of disappeared off the screen, so I'm just wondering if you are able to come back in. Um, but, uh, but I also wonder, you know, whether, whether, risk, whether you think, as you say, you, you're sort of busy doing the stuff, but do you think risk managers overall have increased their professionalism in the past year? Do you think it has it has kind of opened their eyes to the need, or do you think that there's still an enormous amount of work to do? Well, I can answer for, 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 the truth is, before this, we all believed that to be a risk manager, you've got to have a qualification called X. And uh, the tradition said the people that transcended to becoming risk managers started off as maybe some kind of auditors. And I did this, I think, in the 90s, so uh, most of us were still being born. But, uh, you, you know, in the 90s, you know, it was a transition from auditor to risk manager. And, and I actually remember questioning myself then to say, I don't think this is the correct training. Maybe I should be an engineer. Maybe I should be an actuary. The truth is to be a risk manager takes so much of a diverse skill set that even today, Maggie ought to be learning how to code. Liz, you ought to be learning uh, uh, about deep machine learning. You, you ought to be learning things that are so uncomfortable because when there is a problem, you are not sitting at a table with a risk register because that's irrelevant now. You are dealing with a problem and the executives are going to turn their gaze to you and say, how do we solve this problem? You can't do that with basic risk training. We've got to go further. We've got to seek further knowledge that is beyond our curriculum. Thank you very much indeed, Terence. Um, some of the questions that are coming from the floor, I mean, um, Christopher here says what COVID did was just to direct more attention 
to health and safety risk, everything else remained unchanged. Um, so it's quite an interesting take on it. I'm just wondering what you think the key lessons learned are from the pandemic. You know, what do you think that as risk managers, what's going to be your takeaway that for the future? What are you, what are you going to do next time? Well, hopefully not, there won't be a next time around, but if there was to be another major global crisis, what lessons can you take from what you've just gone through to help you into the future? Maggie, do you want to do you want to start us off on that one? Yeah, Liz. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. I think what the biggest lesson is that we must reinvent our risk uh, analysis and also our risk appetite, so that we can foresee the unforeseeable. Because what it is was a lot of people during the pandemic were found napping. And at a project level, we were found in a situation where we never anticipated project delays of mega projects of over six months because of the lockdowns. And our contracts, yet all these things like, you know, you need to pay for any delay to the contractor. And what you then, the risk then becomes the doubling of the project costs. And also a lot of these risks were not shared and were not anticipated. So the biggest lesson is for us to be very holistic and, and reimagine risk management. Thank you. Thank you. Stanley, would, what would be your kind of key message from, or key, key learning from the past year? Um, I think uh, just maybe referring to what maybe Terence pointed out earlier on as well, when he was talking about uh, integration, we have actually seen that uh, when the pandemic came, uh, the business continuity plans were not even actually integrated to the strategy, strategy that was actually driving companies. The ERIM was on its own. The business continuity plans were on their own. So there was that sort of uh, divorce from the core issues that these should be integrated. They should actually be more focused. So that needs to change in terms of making sure that it's embedded within your uh, strategic plans and uh, the contingency plans that you actually have to come up with as well, they have to be embedded to, within your, 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 your risk management. Because whenever I, I, I might actually say that I'm going to manage this risk this way, but what if it materialized? How do I actually manage? So you find that at times you will find that there might have been uh, risk controls that are in place, but there was no contingency plan. So at times you find that there is that change that needs to happen to make sure that there is integration and that would actually drive the companies forward. And as well, these business continuity transplants, they also have to be tested. Some of them, they were not actually tested. And uh, that's very important, I think, going forward. Thank, thank you. I mean, Maggie, we've, we've sorry, Terence, I'll bring you back in in a moment. I'm just gonna give you a couple more messages from the audience. One, somebody said risk professionals need to be more proactive and need to identify, develop skills on identifying emerging risks. And somebody else agrees with you, Terence, so I'll bring you back in. If you think risk management is all in risk registers and heat maps, risk management would not ever be valued. Risk managers need to be good business analysts and have analytical skills. So Beautiful. Terence, over to you. And then Maggie, perhaps you can come in with your lessons. I, I think that um, there's a few notes I was just taking on my phone. So if I look down, it's just a consultant because I don't want to miss any of them. I think your question is very important, Liz. I think that my message to practitioners and those that are here is that the world has become unpredictable. In fact, it's always been unpredictable. Maybe knowledge has not traveled fast enough. Maybe we haven't been at the core face of the problems. I've always said as we grow up, we begin to wonder, was, was the world like this when we're growing up? Or, 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 or has it changed? And I, and I always say it's because you are more present in, in the realities. Number two, we're not magicians. Uh, we're not going to solve everything by luck. We're not going to solve everything by wishing it away. I've always said burying your head in the sand is not going to solve a problem. Uh, we aren't future tellers. So let's not imagine that today we're going to get better at foretelling the future. Because I can ask any question today and say, will it happen tomorrow? And most of us are going to wonder. In fact, we might not even do anything about it. Uh, the truth is we can lose control. So, and, and one of the things I wanted to highlight here is practitioners you know, I, I get tired of opening the paper and discovering that I didn't know this until the paper came out. By the time it's in the paper, it's too late. 
You know, and that's just how weird it is. By the time I'm reading it in the morning paper, if we're still reading morning papers or on Twitter, whatever it is you use for news, it's too late. So, so one of the things I'm learning is that we need to become obsessed, live in the moment, but obsessed about the future. History can teach us about how we can do things better here and there. But let's not be so obsessed about historical information because if a risk manager is focused on history, and I've seen this in my career, they become irrelevant. When you wait to present your report, will people are discussing a problem that's happening right now, and you're waiting just for your turn patiently to present historical facts, guess what? You become irrelevant over time. So obsess with the present and the future. Become a researcher, research problems. Convince Stanley, if that's your boss or your, your manager or your leader, that I will fix this with you. Don't, you know, I used to have practitioners say, there's a problem at the office. Then I say, what are you doing here? They say, well, because there's a meeting. I say, no, you ought to be with your CEO. If your CEO says, leave you, say, I'll be sitting outside. I'm ready to, to assist. So I think we need to be present, worry more about the future, you know, scenario planning, focus on scenario planning. More than ever now, whenever we ask what if in history, people used to say, are you, those are crazy ideas. Now more than ever, I don't think people think our ideas are crazy. I think they now understand that these are ideas to be engaged with in a balanced manner. So as a practitioner, maybe focus less on history and focus more on future-focused information. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Terence. And I'm really sorry to have to do this to everybody, but we are out of time. Gody, I don't know if you are still able to, to join us. I know you were having problems there. Rory, perhaps you could come back in here and just um, close close our conference down for us, um, because I, 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 I'm struggling to see who else is on the line at the moment. Rory, can are you able to to come back in for us? i uh, sorry. Before Rory comes in to 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 close. Um, ah, fantastic! You're back. Sorry, I, yes. I had lost you. <laughs> <laughs> so um, just to, to thank uh, Liz um, and the panelists for the um, um, uh, enlightening discussion on, on sectoral risk maturity. I think we've all learned a lot. Um, it's unfortunate that the time was not enough, but can never be enough. So I think uh, that's the reality of the world that we live in. Uh, but before uh, we, we, we close down the session, we we'll just want uh, to acknowledge the presence of Maggie, who's our chairperson of uh, the, the ZIM chapter of the Institute of Risk Management. Um, you see on the screen to your left there. Uh, to your right there is, is Godima Ziwa. He is the secretary, the person who does all the running around and puts um, everything together for us. Um, I, I, there are also other you know, committee members, Alfreda. Uh, I'm sure I will see her shortly. Uh, and John Kavi, I'm, I'm the vice chair to, to Maggie there. So thank you very much, everyone, for putting everything together. But I think we'll get a form of you no know, vote of thanks. But before we get to that, we have Regina, who just wants to share with us. Regina is with our Power Utility Corporation, um, and she's a very active member on our platforms. So she she she's done a risk management degree, is doing a master's um, at the moment. So please, uh, Regina, I know you've got a few ways to share with us. Please go ahead, Regina. Uh, thank you very much. You know, when COVID struck, I thought it was the end of IRM seminars and workshops. I thought it was the dead end. But then the good news came that we were going to hold webinars. Thank you very much to the IRIM organizers for organizing IRIM webinars. You know, personally, I've attended a number of webinars. I've attended the Scotland one, the Southern African Region Conference, as well as the Solvents to Review Seminar. They were very insightful. Thank you very much to the organizers. You know, webinars come with a lot of advantages. They are very convenient. 
You can attend from everywhere in the world. Right now I'm in Zimbabwe, but I'm interacting with people from all over the world, people from America, people from the United Kingdom, people from Zambia, everywhere in the world. Webinars are very important in this life. You know, webinars will help you to divert attention from the sorrowful messages that you see on WhatsApp in this pandemic. If you look at your WhatsApp platform, you see messages of people that are dead, messages of people that are dying. But then if there's a webinar, you have something to look forward to. You become happy. At least you have something to plan. You will write down questions that you will have to ask on the webinar. Personally, they have helped me on my mental health. Imagine you're just at home, knowing whether you're going to be alive or not the next day. But then, boom, there is a webinar. You have something to look forward to. You know, webinars have the advantage of reaching a lot of audience in a short period of time. They are very important to us. Lastly, but not least, let me start by saying our risk professional life is not complete if we don't enroll with IRM. We need to enroll with Institute of Risk Management. Thank you very much once again to the organizers for coming up with the idea of webinars. I thank you. Thank you very much, Regina. Um, I couldn't have said it in a better way. Um, thank you so much. Um, I'll ask Alfreda to give uh, the vote of thanks so that we can close this session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Nyamazana. I, I just want you to confirm if you can hear me. Loud and clear, uh, although we can't see you, but we can hear you loud and clear. Please go ahead. Sure. I'm, OK, I'm going to use my audio. To all our distinguished lead presenters, Engineer Manoa, Dr. Stanley Mtenga, and uh, Terence Murasiki, leaders of industry amongst us and sectors across the various uh, countries represented on this platform, fellow risk management practitioners or protocols observed. On behalf of IRM Zimbabwe Regional Group and our parent body, IRM UK, would like to express our sincere gratitude for all proceedings, insights that have been shared and the passion towards the, the practice. And above all, if fueling our wings to carry through the mandate we have for, for effective and robust risk management um, structures in all facets that we lead. This engagement could not have come at a better time than this and we embrace everything that it has brought as we continue to evolve and mutate on the winds, to actually ride on the winds of change. Thank you for sharing key in, in insights on the attribute-based maturity index. Very exciting. Um, thank you for sharing as well the, the, the key emphasis on implementation of risk appetite um, statements across the various organizations that, that, that was shared by Engineer Manua. I would like to challenge each and every one of us Let's embrace the speed at which the new technology and innovation is ha happening and let's be the leaders we are called to be. Let's go and make an e impact. Let's go and make a change, starting with our individual lives, our families, and the various entities we lead and serve. Thank you for creating time out of your very busy schedules to uphold the practice of risk ma management that we may continue to create continuously improving en entities to support the next um, generations. It definitely there's need for us to continue to upskill ourselves and grow by the day. Thank you very much. Um, I will hand over back to Mr. Nyamazana. 
Thank you so much, Alfreda, for thanking us. Um, uh, thank you, everyone, for coming to attend. Um, God bless you. God bless your families. Uh, please keep safe um, in this um, in environment. Thank you. Over to you, Rory. Perfect. Thank you very much, guys. Hope you have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.